Okay, let's talk about closing arguments. Well, we start with the ending. Uh, closing arguments are a critically important part of any uh, trial, uh, and it's important that you understand uh, everything about them and that you be expert at the mechanics uh, and the substance of closing arguments. Now, the rules related to closing arguments are special evidentiary rules because, for the most part, they amount to ethical rules. So that violation, certainly intentional violation, of closing argument rules amount to ethical violations. So let's talk first about uh, the rules, uh, the evidentiary rules that apply to closing arguments. You must not state a personal belief. You not, must not, uh, and I'd recommend uh, learning to never say, I believe in your closing argument. And even better, uh, I would recommend just as mechanically getting it out of your vocabulary to say, I think. Uh, it's good at this early point to get rid of those words, get those words out of your vocabulary in your closing argument and even uh, in pretty much any part of the trial. Your personal belief has nothing to do with the jury's decision. You must not ask, usually, you must not ask the jury to base its decision on anything other than the law and the evidence in the case. Uh, so the evidence is a couple of things. The evidence is the admitted evidence. So that would be testimony, uh, exhibits admitted into evidence, not things marked for identification. Uh, the evidence is reasonable inferences from that evidence. And the evidence is matters of common knowledge. It's improper to refer to things like uh, evidence not admitted, like background evidence. If your client didn't take the stand, your defense lawyer, your client didn't take the stand, presented no evidence. It's co that's common in the desperate business of criminal defense. If you presented no evidence about your client's background, and none came in sort of accidentally uh, in the prosecution's case, then you cannot refer to the background of your client uh, unless uh, there's some inference to be drawn from the evidence that's already in. You must not exclude, uh, you must not speak about excluded evidence. And that's a huge mistake and very much an ethical uh, violation to talk about evidence that was excluded by the judge. Uh, you must not argue evidence uh, that was admitted for a particular reason, a, uh, for reason A, you must not argue it for reason B. You must not, uh, if, if, to give you a concrete example, if uh, some, uh, some piece of evidence is admitted to show the plaintiff's knowledge, but not for the truth of the matter asserted, a common thing in a trial, you must not offer that evidence, you must not argue that evidence for anything other than for the plaintiff's state of mind or knowledge. Uh, the prosecutor, in a criminal case, the prosecutor should, or new prosecutors, should, should just learn to never argue that evidence is uncontested to or uncontradicted. Uh, prosecutors should learn to just never say that. The uh, prosecutor should learn, uh, or should, should never uh, refer to a defendant's post-arrest silence. Uh, maybe a, a, more, a more relaxed rule is at least never refer, if you're the prosecutor, to a defendant's post-arrest silence unless you have the judge's advance approval. That's the cautious way to do it, and that's the uh, best way to do it. Uh, strangely enough, there are some things that, um, to be technical about it, are not in evidence that you can refer to, but very few. For example, most judges will let you refer to innocuous personal experiences about your, what your grandmother used to tell you, uh, or uh, what a, or, you know, endearing little stories like that. Most judges are going to let you do that, even though those things are not in evidence. Uh, it's best, though, to never make any references to God or, or religion, uh, unless you have thought long and hard about the propriety of doing that. Uh, some judges, some appellate judges, some legal scholars think it is improper to make ad hominem attacks. So what's an ad hominem attack? It's something like 
uh, an extremely personal attack, uh, calling a witness a liar. Uh, but uh, I, I happen to disagree. If the evidence supports that argument, then it's an appropriate, uh, it, it's, it's a, uh, an argument that is permissible. But watch out, because uh, where you are arguing first, uh, in some jurisdictions, if you're the defendant, you argue first, you make a so-called ad hominem attack, then the prosecutor, it, it in some way opens the door to the prosecutor to respond with equally nasty attacks. And on appeal, the appellate courts often will consider and point out that the defendant started it by making these harsh personal attacks, and it was not error, it was not an abuse for the prosecutor to make similar arguments in her closing because the defendant started it. Uh, you must not argue that the jury has a duty to deter crime. Uh, the jury's duty is to consider the evidence in light of the instructions from the judge on the law and to decide whether the case has been proven according to law, to law and the jury instructions. The jury does not have a duty to deter a crime, and you, as the prosecutor, cannot argue that, and as a defense lawyer, you should object if you hear that being done. Uh, you, uh, the jury, you must not argue that the jury should send a message. Uh, the juries do not send messages except in punitive damages cases, which are rather unusual. Uh, not incredibly rare, but pretty unusual. Uh, so, uh, the, uh, sending a message, if you're a defense counsel, if the prosecutor talks about uh, sending a message, or if in a civil case, if one side talks about sending a message, that's a red flag, and you should be on your feet. And by the time, and you're on your feet and opening your mouth, hopefully by the time you open your mouth, you figure out, figured out whether or not this was a good objection on your part. If it's not a good objection, you just sit, you just sit down, but if it, is, if it is a good objection, you object. Uh, there are, uh, you must avoid golden rule uh, arguments. What is a golden rule argument? A golden rule argument is when you place the jurors in the position of a party or a witness. So you cannot argue, uh, how would you feel if you were the uh, victim of this medical negligence? Or we've, uh, there, there's one argument, one sample argument in the book, which is a wonderful, wonderful book. Uh, but there, there's one sample argument where, the, in, in which the, uh, it must be the plaintiff's counsel says, uh, haven't we all been in that position where we put a little too much gas, we give it a little too much gas or something like that? That's an improper argument. You cannot put uh, jurors uh, into the place of a party or a witness. So uh, th those are the basic ethical rules in uh, making arguments in civil and criminal cases. Let's talk about uh, the jury's perspective on closing arguments. Jurors, by the, they didn't want to do this in the first place, 90% of them or more. Judges in Massachusetts, we get to talk to every jury that, uh, on every case that we uh, preside over. And every judge that I know takes every single opportunity they can because it's such a, uh, really a delicious opportunity for trial lawyers. All your life, you, in most jurisdictions, you cannot talk to them. And it's a huge ethical no-no to do that without the judge's approval. So all the judges that I know talk to them every single time they have a case afterwards. Uh, and so we know what they're thinking about. And for the most part, they're reluctant to be jurors. Not all of them, but a high percentage. When I say 90% are reluctant, that's low. That's conservative. Uh, and when they go into that closing argument, they are so tired. Not, they're tired and they're sick and tired of the trial. Please trust me on this. Uh, and they know the facts. And, and once they start deliberating, they're going to know the facts 
as well or better than you. Because there'll be whatever size the jury is, jury is, let's assume 12 people, 12 people with a collective intelligence in a range of life experience that would knock your socks off. So they know the facts. So, uh, and most of them are opinionated by that time. You would be too. You would be too. Uh, and they're resistant to opposing opinions. Uh, and uh, although uh, they want to feel good about what they're doing. Now, perhaps most of you have never sat on a jury, but it really, even though people don't want to do it, it's a very inspiring process. In, in the American judicial system, jurors want to do the right thing. They want to promote fairness and justice. They take it seriously. So, uh, what does this mean? What, are these, what does this perspective on these jurors mean? It means a whole bunch of things. But most of all, it means that you must be efficient and focused. And I look at all of you and you kind of, in your facial expression, say, yeah, I get that, I, yeah, I get that. Efficient and focused. But you don't get it. And it's my job to start that process. You've got to understand, you've got to be efficient and focused. So any given trial, I could hand you a trial out of those uh, materials and give it to you, and I would bet the rent money that you would overtry it. And what does that mean? Overtrying? You probably got a pretty good idea. Overtrying it means uh, every part of your case would be too long, too long, and you would not give. I mean, I'd put money on this if judges were allowed to bet. I don't know. Maybe we are actually. I put money on this. You would overtry every aspect of the case. And this applies to your closing arguments. They must be brief, they must be focused, and they must be efficient. And, uh, and, and yes, I will be repetitive about this point because you've got to learn this point. You've got to give the jurors credit. Uh, they have uh, a huge amount of intelligence. They understand what's going on. And the author of our book, a wonderful, wonderful book, I learned so much in reading it. Much of it is, much of the things in, in the book are things that have been learned in the last 30 years, and it's so nice to read them in a nice, uh, concise form. But uh, anywhere where it says, even a little bit, that you should repeat key facts or key concepts uh, is suspect. Avoid repetition if at all possible. I'm not talking about repetition as a rhetorical device. Uh, so don't summarize or repeat the evidence unless it is absolutely essential. So the kiss of death in a closing argument, uh, well, there are a couple of things that I strongly recommend to you on the kiss of death. May it please the court? Please, please don't say that. Please don't say that. If, if you plan to come in here and say, may it please the court, can you? just discreetly just cross it out. Uh, or a witness by witness summary, even brief summary. Well, John Smith, the first witness called, called by the plaintiff, he said blah, 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 blah. And Jane Jones, the second witness called by the plaintiff, said blah, 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 blah. No. No can do. You can't do that. That you're going to lose the jury really fast. You tell the jurors, what you do do, is you tell the jurors what the evidence means. What the evidence means in terms of the elements of the claim, of the elements of the charge, uh, what the evidence means in terms of the elements of the defense, civil or criminal. Uh, you are speaking to the undecided jurors, and there are very few, uh, and you're arming the persuaders that watch your account of what's going on in this case. So you're speaking to that three out of 12 who haven't made up their mind. Uh, I have nothing to back this up, but maybe those are very educated people that actually are holding back the judgment. Uh, and you're speaking to the people that are buying your account of what happened so that when they get down uh, in the real guts of jury deliberation, they're armed with the kinds of arguments and can, uh, that they need to persuade the other people to go your way. You're, uh, you're speaking to them about how they can achieve fairness and justice. Key. It's really key. It's about uh, achieving fairness and justice. You've got to get to the core issues quickly, and you have to. 
Okay, so you have to go quickly to the core issues and concede what you must concede and even what you probably should concede. So if on if there are four elements to the claim uh, that it, you, know, you represent the defendant, uh, and there are four elements where you are dead in the water or extremely weak, concede them right from the beginning. And maybe even don't even mention them. Don't take up the juror's valuable time by talking to them. And you can just say, it's about that fourth element that we need to talk. So get right to the core issues and address the, those issues candidly. You can't fool these people. They have, there are 12 of them. They don't have to sit there and do this incredibly uh, pressured, uh, pressured thing, like try a case. They don't have to understand all these things about this case. They don't have to listen to the witnesses' answers. They don't have to do anything. They just sit there and process it all. There are 12 of them. They have the, the uh, luxury of sitting there and taking it all in. Uh, and they have a vast amount of life experience that is extremely diverse in comparison to yours and at the beginning of your career, and it was much longer than yours, so that they have uh, a, uh, an intellectual ability to master very complicated facts. Uh, you should uh, empower them to do justice. So in a criminal case, jurors need to understand that uh, it's really their determination. Empower them to do justice by teaching them about how uh, or, or why they should see the case go away. Uh, and you, you should persuade them uh, through both content and delivery. Now the jury instructions are pretty important. We won't really spend much time in this course on jury instructions, but in that, uh, on Blackboard, in the section related to this class, I put up a set of civil and criminal jury instructions. But don't kill any trees by printing those out, is my recommendation. There is a slow trend towards giving jurors uh, written copies of the jury instructions. Uh, it is a fairly slow trend depending on the pressures on the court where the case is being heard. So I have a suspicion that in federal court where there's much less time pressure, I bet they do it in most cases. Uh, and I say that with little evidence. Uh, in, in state courts where there's much more time pressure, they do it in fewer cases. But what you'll see online in the course is a sample civil and criminal set of jury instructions. And those are jury instructions. Those are complete sets of jury instructions that are given to the jurors in actual cases. So the earlier you understand the jury instructions, the better. Uh, the earlier you understand them, the better. They're very important. Uh, you should uh, understand the local rules, on, or local or state rules, on when they must be filed. The, uh, a, a safe rule in terms of protecting the record on appeal with jury instructions is to always make your request uh, before the judge instructs the jury and to remake it after the judge uh, makes her instructions to the jury. So, uh, concerning. And what that means is, uh, what that really means is that perhaps before the uh, uh, the judge charges the jury. You have something akin to a formal charge conference where you might have a pretty lengthy discussion with the judge, with the court reporter or in some courts a taping system taking down everything you say. And you probably have a pretty detailed discussion of the various jury instructions you're requesting. But it's very important. Uh, the safe rule is after the judge has instructed the jury and failed to do it the way you want it, to say to the judge at sidebar, usually with the jury in the room, but uh, semi-whispering at sidebar, but making sure it's making it to the court reporter or the taping system, to say things like, and I renew my request for a self-defense instruction, and then in one sentence or sentence fragment, getting at the core of what it is you want. Uh, and that, so you, gotta, you really have to understand what you're doing if you're going to say something complicated in a sentence or a sentence fragment. So for a self-defense self instruction, it's probably something like, Judge, I'm asking that you instruct. It's very complicated. There's a lot to a self-defense instruction. Retreat rules and all sorts of things like this. But 
what you're probably going to want first and foremost is, Judge, I want you to instruct the jury that the prosecutor must prove the absence of self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. So it's not just, I want my instruction number 12, or I want my instruction number 14, or I want a self-defense instruction. The good, good, good lawyers get right into it in a sentence or a sentence fragment, so there's no way the appeals court can say, oh, they didn't protect the record. That instruction wasn't presented squarely to the judge. Too bad. Uh, affirmed on appeal. So uh, the content of closing arguments. The goals here are, yes, yes, to be quick and efficient. And I'm hoping that's the only thing I'm going to repeatedly say in my closing argument about closing arguments. <coughs> but quick and efficient. It's really key. Try to learn that from the very beginning. Uh, themes and labels are, uh, are essential to a high level closing argument. Themes and labels. So, uh, and our book gives a wonderful list of various kinds of themes. And I learned all kinds of things from that. And I'll talk about that in just a second. But uh, themes and labels are essential to a high level closing argument. You can't have a high level closing argument without a theme. So the beginning of the closing argument, you want a modern closing argument. And our book uses a different term. He calls it an impact beginning. An impact beginning. I like that. That's good. That's good. That's better than my term, modern, uh, uh, modern beginning to your closing argument. And he gives five different ways you can do it, and all of them are excellent. Number one, he says, your theme. Hammer that theme. So I don't like this as a theme, but uh, if the glove doesn't fit, you must acquit. All right? It's, it, I don't think it's a really good theme, but it's a memorable one. When I say it to you, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, or the event. You know how you had just, you know, my opening statement was last week, and you had just met me, and I started talking about stabbing someone uh, 30 times. And not good for an opening statement, by the way, but we'll work on that later. Uh, that's the event. If you jump right, if you're the prosecutor, you jump right into, uh, he kicked the door down and then he pulled out that butcher knife and plunged it into her chest six times. And then there's a little pregnant pause there, a little, let those words hang. That's the, the, that's the, the event or uh, a dramatic event. Uh, uh, beginning to a closing argument. Or dramatic evidence, same thing. Same kind of thing. You start your closing argument with dramatic evidence. Uh, in, uh, or, uh, in an emotional way, you empower the jury. So, uh, the less serious a criminal case, the more important jury nullification is. So, if you, if you don't have anything better, hopefully you have something better, like a wonderful theme, or hopefully you have something like a dramatic event to begin your closing argument with a modern beginning to your closing argument. Uh, but if you don't, you can begin what the author, with what uh, he calls uh, uh, emotionally empowering the jury, which might be something like this. In a jury nullification case, which is a huge percentage of criminal cases, it might be something like uh, you, the jury, have the power to do justice in this case. You determine what the facts are, and you return a verdict that is uh, that your conscience, conscience, accepts. I don't know, something like that. That's that's what he's talking about when he says, "With emotion empowering the jury," uh, or with an inspiring story. So, uh, uh, an inspiring story, uh, you know, one that. Uh, uh, some, there are some inspiring stories, kind of like from folklore and our uh, culture. Uh, and those are not in evidence or anything like that, but you can get away with those somewhat. Uh, I'm going to suggest that, that kind of open beginning to your closing and uh, the emotionally empowering the jury about jury nullification or whatever it is you're going to empower them about. Those things are not the top choice, uh, but you've got to do. Uh, with what you've got. So uh, perhaps you end up with those beginnings uh, to the closing argument. All right, so let's talk about what you should, what you should argue. 
like the middle, the big middle of your closing argument. Uh, you should uh, you should concede what you must concede, and you probably should concede anything uh, that's really weak on your part, even if you don't absolutely have to. It's very important to get the get credibility with the jurors uh, when you argue. Uh, if it's a close case, uh, you should argue both sides, just based on social science research. Uh, and uh, you, should, uh, you should deal with the juror's questions. Now, this is not always easy, uh, especially for persons new to trial practice. But you should deal with what you imagine and what your friends and colleagues imagine will be the problems in your case. Uh, and, uh, and it, it can be hard if you argue first and in your jurisdiction uh, the other side argues next and there's no rebuttal. It's very important, very important that you deal with the emotional core of the case. And this applies to judges too. It really does. But with jurors, it, it is essential that you deal with the emotional core of the case. Even if in your intellectual uh, uh, analysis of the case, you know 150% that the emotional core of the case has nothing to do with how the case should be decided. You've got to deal with the emotional core of the case, and you should do it with judges too. I strongly recommend it. Uh, how to argue? You should be assertive and confident uh, when you make your points. You should be assertive and con uh, confident. Uh, but a little footnote to that. Uh, you know, you, you're new to the business. Uh, it's okay if you're not completely confident. It's okay, it's okay if you're not very confident. But you must not betray any lack of belief. Even though you can't say you believe in it, you must not betray any lack of commitment and belief in your client's cause. So, I'm confident and assertive. But if I'm not confident and assertive, it better be clear to the jury that the reason I'm not is because I'm really nervous because I'm new to this business. So you must, uh, you don't have to be Perry Mason or whatever the modern equivalent of Perry Mason is. But if you are nervous and you show it and things like that, you've got to explain to the jury that you're nervous because you're new to the case. And, uh, and they've got to understand on an emotional level that you're totally committed to your client's cause. Uh, and you're with him or her. And it doesn't, it has to do with your nervousness, not your lack of commitment. You should back up your points. You should do that by uh, using exhibits. You know, in your final trial, I'll require you to use the exhibits in some kind of demonstrative date. We're gonna be realistic about it. I'm not gonna expect you to, like my mock trial did, King did, uh, spend many hundreds of dollars on beautiful exhibits that get thrown away at the end of the competition. Uh, but you've got to use exhibits. Uh, this lecture is too long. We learn in 10-minute pieces. We learn in 10-minute pieces. Uh, and we, uh, if we don't break it up with things like exhibits and demonstrative aid, then we're lousy advocates. You can't do it, you know, the jurors, and you and me, we're not really interested in watching some dude talk for a very long period of time. And long is anything more than 10 or 12 minutes. You should refer to the jury instructions somewhat. Closing arguments are not really about the law. So there's a limit to how much you should talk about the law in a closing argument. But in all but the most incredibly simple cases, you should make some reference to the jury instructions. Common sense and life experiences have everything to do with this. It's about common sense. Uh, stories uh, and analogies, as long as they're not golden rule violations. Stories and analogies are good. Uh, as long as they're not uh, putting the jurors in the place of, say, a witness, or saying to them effectively, how would you feel? Because you can't do that. And rhetorical questions, how couldn't rhetorical questions be great? Rhetorical questions are a great thing. They're a great thing just because people like rhetorical questions, but also because uh, there's going to be an age difference. There's a vast age and socioeconomic 
uh, uh, scan on most juries. And if you say, uh, you folks are obligated to find that defendant guilty, that, that's, that's not a, a good idea because uh, the, many of these folks will be your elders. Uh, questions are almost always better. Rhetorical questions are a wonderful device. Uh, visual aids and demonstrative aids are essential. Uh, and uh, avoid uh, civics lessons. Now, some discussion of the law is great, but you know this. Well, uh, folks, uh, so this is the stage of the case where I get to argue to you about what I think the evidence means. But your evidence controls. Uh, uh, your memory of the evidence controls, not mine. And after we're done with, the, with these closing arguments, the judge is going to instruct you, and you're going to uh, you're going to be given a, a jury verdict form, and you're going to go in to deliberate. All the civics lesson stuff, unless you have a good reason otherwise, can it? It's a waste of your breath. Use your time to persuade. Uh, the, the end of the end, the end of the closing is very important. You've got to show passion and emotion in that your result, what you're arguing for, will do justice. Because in all their cynicism, all their uh, uh, dread of jury service, jurors want to do justice. Uh, you should be hammering at that theme. So uh, it's uh, in, a, uh, in a closing argument, that thing, you're going to be hammering at the theme at the, at the beginning, all throughout, and at the end of the closing argument. That is uh, close to essential for a closing argument. Uh, avoid summarizing the evidence. Avoid that. Avoid summarizing the evidence uh, unless, uh, uh, unless there's some good reason to do it. The end of your closing argument should be uh, pithy, quick, uh, and have a lot of emotional impact. And uh, in all except for the simplest of cases, you should tell the jurors exactly what you want them to do. These civil cases can be very, very complicated. The jury verdict form, you practically need, it's not a, they don't call it a Venn diagram, but you practically need flow charts for the, the judges and the lawyers to understand the civil jury verdict form. If yes, go to paragraph 36. If no, go to paragraph 41. It, it's very complicated. So in all but the, the <coughs> most simple cases, uh, explain to them exactly what you want them to do, perhaps by displaying the jury verdict form. All right, so uh, how about your delivery? You've got to show passion and commitment. And you don't have to be an expert at this, but there can't be any doubt about your commitment to your client. No legalese or pompous language, no may it please the court, uh, no acting like a lawyer, none of that stuff. Now, so why did I make you get up on your feet for a minute at the la in the last class meeting? Because I wanted to see how you talk like a regular person. And you were all wonderful, very warm, interesting human beings. Please don't go all the way to the other side with those boring, pompous, stuffed shirt lawyers. Talk just like you talked last week. You know, you can be, you may think you're Clarence Darrow, and if that's a real you, go for it. But don't change your essential self. Be authentic, be real, and you'll be a much better advocate. Talk like you did last week, except it's about the case. It's about the case. That's the only difference. There's no fundamental difference in the way you should be delivering uh, your uh, remarks today. And avoid podiums. I don't know if there's a plural to podium. Podium. Yeah. But uh, this is the most you can do. Now, you're not going to be using any notes. So, uh, what is it? Podia. Podia. What a guess, huh? And I never took a day of Latin. <laughs> <laughs> I will leave it. But, but the, uh, <laughs> at the side is the most you can do. At, at the front is, is, you know, uh, is, is the worst thing possible. But today, you won't have any notes. I want to talk to you about notes in a second. Uh, but avoid uh, uses of a podium, and at the worst, or I'm sorry, at the best, put it to the side. So the notes, I, we talked about this before, but I think I should talk about it again, because it's different than a lot of people think. 
I want you to do these first closing arguments without notes. And it's not because I think that when you're later in your career and you're trying Microsoft versus General Motors, I want you to just wing it. I mean, what the heck? Let's have fun. <laughs> no, it's not that. What it is is, see, I see a wide range of cases. And I see incredible lawyers coming in and getting $14 million verdicts and vice versa and all stuff like that and excellent lawyers uh, and, and incredible uh, lawyers on murder cases. And then I see people who are totally new to the bar and are trying their first case. And the, the biggest crutch, if I had to identify the biggest crutch for new lawyers, it's those notes. So yeah, uh, what I'm saying is, don't use them now, but you very quickly, after you have that out-of-body experience of doing a closing argument without notes, after you have that out-of-body experience, then you can slowly transition back to using notes. And it can be pretty quick, uh, but it's worth it. Yes, you're going to miss some point. Big deal. This is a course. They're not going to drag your client away to uh, the uh, lethal injection chamber if you lose. <laughs> this is the time to do it, to take chances. So do it without notes, and then you quickly, once you realize you can do that, can transition to using notes a little. One wonderful lawyer that I know uh, had, will, will have one page of notes in much smaller writing than this, but we'll have one page of notes for murder cases uh, in, so that she can be sure that she doesn't miss any point at all. And that's a good technique. But there are a variety of ways of doing it. All of them, I believe, are great, except for one thing. I say start out in your career without notes. Uh, you know, six months from now, when you take Judge Whitehead's course, Advanced Trial Advocacy, then you can start using notes uh, for closing arguments. I'm not, I am, I'm not saying that you shouldn't. I'm saying you should use notes for witness examination. But for opening statements and closing arguments, throw the crutches away. I can walk, OK? You can do that. And then transition into some limited use of notes. And you'd be a much better advocate for it. Uh, don't, be a, uh, don't worry about being a perfect speaker. This is a corollary of the don't be afraid to be nervous. You know, uh, George W. Bush or Mayor Menina, incredibly successful politicians. Nobody cared that they couldn't speak proper English. So don't worry about that. My daughter uh, came and watched me speak to a jury pool, you know, that sort of pre-jurors before they're selected. Uh, and she was shocked when I said, I used the word ink in my remarks. That's what it's about. It's, actually, it's kind of fake on my part. But it's, it's my attempt to be authentic. It's fake authentic. Uh, there are a lot of different ways to prepare for a closing argument. None of them is, is inherently right. You do it the way you think. Except I don't want you to use notes in the closing argument. But I shouldn't even say this first because it's, it's probably not the number one way to do it. Some people sit down and just write the whole thing out, sentences, longhand, but then you've got to reduce it. Uh, and that's a big job. But that's one way to do it. Or some people just write notes. Uh, there's, no, there's no special correct way of doing that. And your preparation method will evolve, of course. Uh, control movement uh, is very important. So when you move, Move for a purpose. Hopefully that's what I'm doing. I am using notes here, that's true. Uh, but your movement should be controlled. It can't be that your, well, your, your argument should be very short. Let's say it's 25 minutes long uh, in a real case. You can't stand there and talk to these poor people for 25 minutes. You're going to drive them insane. I judge a lot of mock trials. and. Uh, and they're usually, they're usually high school students, and they are incredible. But one thing they do is they talk to you from the whole time from the same spot. It's like their feet are nailed to the ground, and it's scary. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> uh, so a uh, change in topic or for emphasis uh, to, uh, you know, uh, so I'm, I'm arguing this murder case uh, and uh, 
So when Jane Smith testified about where my client, John Jones, was, couldn't you see that she was telling the truth in the way she spoke to you? You move for a purpose. And there shouldn't be any movement that's, uh, that's just random uh, either. And you shouldn't, uh, movement is not a way to dispel nervousness. Well, it can be actually, but uh, it, you should be careful. You know, so uh, wearing a long hole in front of, in, in the carpet in front of the jurors, that's not good either. So walking back and forth like this, uh, you know, that kind of closing argument, that's not good either. Control movement uh, and, and a significant amount of movement is the way you want to do it. And, and in our culture, for whatever reason, a reasonable amount of eye contact. And you should make sure that you make significant amounts of eye contact with every single juror. I have a very, oh, by the way, last time I lied to you, I said that I would, after 30 years, you're not nervous anymore. That was a lie. I just realized I was nervous before our last class, first class. Actually, I'm nervous before every class, so please don't get the wrong idea. But a reasonable amount of eye contact with every single juror during your closing and actually during the trial. Don't drop, you know, don't make them nervous by making too much eye contact. But reasonable amount of eye contact, for whatever reason, in our culture, is absolutely necessary. And I, I do remember that uh, in the beginning, and actually for the first decade at least, uh, it was really terrifying in trying cases to jurors to get up there, especially for the opening statement, to get up and look in the jurors' eyes. It's really kind of terrifying. It really was. Uh, but it's important for them uh, because they'll evaluate uh, your truth telling, your authenticity based on whether you look them in the eye. Uh, you may know, if, you, if I look right above your, your head on the wall, uh, I don't believe you can tell that I'm looking above you and not right at you, if that makes you feel better. The length of closing arguments, they've got to be incredibly short. They've got to be incredibly short. You've got to get this. Uh, so uh, I was a juror in a, uh, operating under the influence trial maybe three or four years ago and in Lawrence District Court. And the defense lawyer, who was a very well-known defense lawyer, did a closing argument that was absolutely minimum, 45 minutes long. And the trial took maybe a day and a half, a 45-minute closing. Now, doesn't that sound like a reasonable length closing? Wrong. That's terrible. That was borderline malpractice. 45 minutes. <laughs> 45 minutes, you suppose. Uh, and, uh, and many of the people in the courtroom probably wanted to kill him at that point. Uh, they, these closing arguments, it's, you know, it's, well, it's, uh, you know it's, it's much harder to do something well and do it short than to do it long. Uh, you've got to take the time to prepare it and do it very short. Uh, you've got to have, I am, uh, I'm very much a techie. Well, I'm what they call it, a, a sophisticated, non-technical user of computer, which is good, I think. Uh, so I love technology, uh, but we, you've got to have a trial notebook in a trial. Not for your closing argument, because you're not, you don't have 8 million things being thrown at you in an incredibly pressure, stress-filled environment of a trial. Uh, You've got to have a trial notebook. And in most, 95% of the time, it has to be a loose leaf notebook. These things need to be connected. Now, I know there are, there's software out there, much of it free from companies like Lexus, that will organize everything for you. But we're not at the point yet where you can do a trial just off a laptop. It can have a key part in it, but you need uh, notebooks. Because otherwise, during that pressure-filled uh, two days to three months that the trial takes, all your stuff is going to end up in a massive pile uh, on your table. And if you have, you know, if you're with a mega law firm, which many of you would be fortunate enough, I suppose, to, if you think that's fortunate, to uh, work for, uh, you may have uh, associates uh, who are keeping things in order. Uh, but they are effectively being, they're the trial notebook. Uh, a lawyer or two or three 